The Pacific Ocean is huge, covering more than 30% of the Earth's surface. During height of the Age of Discovery, even the most experienced navigators would get lost for days. But the Pacific isn't all water. In fact, there are over 30,000 islands scattered from Asia to the Americas. There may be even more out there waiting to be discovered. This episode, we're going to take a look at an island nation that has already been found. So grab your flip-flops, snorkel, and sunscreen as we take a deep dive into the Micronesian country of Kiribati. I'm Scott Parrish, and you're listening to Dying to Eat, the podcast that delves into different cultures of the world throughout time while exploring the different attitudes about death and food. If you love history, good eating, and fascinating stories, then I've got a great show in store for you. So make sure you stick around to the end to see what's cooking this week. I'd also like to take a moment to thank our sponsor, TheTailoredHemp.com. Now, I like the gummies. Medical News Today says gummies or other edibles can be an easy, tasty, and discreet way of ingesting CBD. Some of the common reasons for taking CBD include pain management and relief from anxiety or depression. So, for high-quality CBD, which is legal in all states, and your questions about CBD, go to thetailoredhemp.com. Now on with the show. Formerly known as the Republic of Kiribati, the tiny reef nation is made up of 33 atolls, only 20 of which are actually populated. These islands are scattered all over a vast area of the ocean. Kiribati extends 1,800 miles eastward from the Gilbert Islands, where the population is concentrated, to the the Line Islands, of which three are inhabited. In between lie uh, islands of the Phoenix Group, which have no permanent population. Total land area is 313 square miles and spread across 1.4 million square miles, which, let's put this into perspective, it would take eight years if you could drive that whole area. The islands of Carabas are so spread out, they span both sides of the equator as well as the international dateline, making Carabas the only country in the world to occupy, to occupy all four cardinal hemispheres. Though the official language of the Caribas is English, most of the people most of the people speak a language called uh, Gilbertese or I Caribas, an oceanic language that differs from English in the pronunciation of certain letters. For instance, the letters T I actually make this S sound. So the name of the country in Gilbertese is Carabas, even though it looks like Carabidi. Being a Micronesian country, Carabas takes a lot of its culture from the Polynesian and Australian tribes. Similar to Hawaii, music plays a big part of the culture, with song and dance being popular ways to tell stories and to communicate. Traditional songs are often love themed, but there are also competitive, religious, children's, patriotic, war and wedding songs. There are also stick dances, which accompany legends and semi-historical stories. These uh, stick dances, or sierre, are performed only during major festivals. Being an island nation in the middle of the ocean, you can imagine that most of Carabas's cuisines come from what they can catch from the sea. Coconuts are general favorite when it comes to sweet treats, while pork is the general favorite when it comes to land food. There aren't a lot of natural carbohydrates to be found in Carabas, so the I Carabas process, the sap of coconut and pandanus trees, consuming it either as beverages or as cakes. After World War II, rice became a daily staple in most households, which is still the case today. The majority of seafood, fish in particular, is eaten sashimi style with either coconut sap, soy sauce, or vinegar-based dressings, often combined with chilies and onions. Coconut crabs and mud crabs are traditionally given to breastfeeding mothers with the belief that meat stimulates the production of good quality breast milk. Now, look, I'm not trying to judge anyone here, but the I care bass for their beliefs, I'm just going to say it this way. There's some wives' tales out there, I think. 
Because it's so isolated, trying to get to Carabas is not easy, and there are only a few flights out to the islands that are scheduled at intervals from only a handful of places in the world. The closest nations to Carabas are Australia and Hawaii, and even those are about 12-hour flights away. But if you do somehow manage to make it there, make sure you ver visit Karamati or Christmas Island. The largest atoll in the world. For those of you not sure of what an atoll is, it's basically a ring-shaped island with the ocean surrounding it, and in the center, Carabas is made up entirely of coral. Even part of it is above water and serves as a wildlife sanctuary today that scuba divers can visit. It wasn't always like that, though. Christmas Island and Carabas as a whole remained largely uninhabited and unchanged for a majority of time. It was only when the first Australian voyagers arrived around 3000 BC, the island finally became a home for life, for human life. While these voyages were the first to settle there, they were certainly not the last to arrive. Over the years, Sailors from Samoa, Fiji, and Tonga introduced some of the Polynesian and Melanesian cultural aspects, such as language and traditions. Around 1300 AD, there was a mass exodus from Samoa. At the same time that cannibalism was forcibly abolished there, leading to the addition of Polynesian ancestry into the mix of most Gilbertese people, these Samoans would later bring strong features of Polynesian languages, culture, and creating clans based on their own Samoan traditions and slowly intertwining with the indigenous clans and powers already dominant in Carabas. The culture adopted a genocratic lifestyle, meaning that they were ruled by their elders rather than a chief. Over the following centuries, civil war became a factor between the chief-led islands in the north and the elder-led islands in the south. Only one island managed to remain neutral and stay out of the conflict. This place is called Tabatuna, whose society was based on a more egalitarian approach. The name Tabatua, Tabatuna stems from the root phrase Tabatuna, meaning chiefs are forbidden, with acquisition of island being the main form of conquest Clans and chiefs began fighting over resources, fueled by hatred and reignited blood feuds, which may have started months, years, sometimes even decades before. At this time, the only weapons they would use were these shark-toothed embedded wooden spears. Sometimes they had knives, sometimes they had swords, and garbs of armor fashioned from dense coconut fiber. Now, I know this sounds a little Gilligan's Island kind of ish stuff but this is real this is real warfare with stuff that they made by hand these weapons and equipment had strong sentimental value and often were items that had been passed down through generations this is a nice this is nice but i think that if i had to go to war with my great grandpa's musket i don't think it would last very long there's so many interesting things that they bring forward from their history in, in this country, though. The turmoil lasted well into the European visitation in the colonial era, which led to certain islands decimating their foes with the help of the guns and cannon-equipped ships that the Europeans were coerced into using by more cunning and persuasive among the uh, Carabas leaders. Ranged weapons we're talking about like bows, slings, and javelins, were seldom used. Hand-to-hand -hand combat was a predominant skill still practiced today, though seldom mentioned because of its various taboos associated with it. Secrecy is the main focus there. These civil wars, though devastating, never came to a conclusion because when the first European explorers arrived, everything changed. Historians can't really seem to agree who found Carabas first. Some think it was the Spanish who sighted some of the islands in the 16th century. Others say it was both English and American ships that made landfall in the 18th and 19th centuries. And even still, others will say that it was the Chinese. Now, I'd like to make a point here that I've made in other episodes where we often 
talk about discovery being linked to Europeans discovering islands. Keep in mind that I've told you that other tribes have already reached these islands and already established it. They just weren't European. Now, look, I'm not a historian, and while it would be nice to know exactly what went down, I'm going to keep it open for your interpretation based on what I've given you. Whoever it was that found Carabas first probably wasn't even looking for it in the first place. At the time, in the 17th and 18th centuries, the age of discovery was over and explorers had stopped trying to discover new places and were more interested in finding good trade routes between places that had already been discovered. Sounds like another episode, huh? Now, there was the smallest chance that any, anybody would find the Carabas Islands, but a chance nonetheless. And that's exactly what happened. Thanks to an agreement between the British and German empires in 1886, the Pacific Ocean had been partitioned into the north and south based on the empire's interest in the waters. Carabas happened to fall within the British Empire's domain, though I'm sure they had no idea that it was even there. The agreement was specifically meant for trade and labor, such as whaling. So when a whaling vessel and then a ship carrying coconut oil happened up on a scattering of islands, I'm sure they were surprised. The British were quick to claim the islands, setting up a British colony and establishing Carabas as a protectorate of the empire in 1892. But not all of these islands were under the protectorate in the beginning. That would happen slowly over the next century. Ban Abba, known to the Europeans as Ocean Island, was added to the protectorate in 1900 because of the phosphate rock in the soil. What was that island nation that we talked about phosphate before? Nauru. So if you're interested in what phosphate does when you start mining it, go back and check out that episode. That episode. For those of you who don't know what phosphate is, it's this natural source of phosphorus, a crucial and common ingredient in fertilizer. It can also be processed to make uh, phosphoric acid, an ingredient in animal feed, cosmetics, and electronics. The islands became the crown colony of Gilbert and Elise Islands in 1916. The Northern Line Islands, including Christmas Island, were added to the colony in 1919, and the Phoenix Islands were added in 1937 with the purpose of a Phoenix Island Settlement Scheme, the last attempt at human colonization in the British Empire. In 1902, the Pacific Cable Board laid the first Trans-Pacific Telegraph Cable from Bamfield, British Columbia, to Fanning Island in the Line Islands, and from Fiji to Fanning Island, thus completing the All Red Line, a series of telegraph lines circumventing the globe completely within the British Empire. The United States and the British Empire played hot potato with many of the Phoenix and Lion Islands in the later part of the 19th century and into the 20th century. Flight capabilities were beginning to be a major factor in trade, commerce, and communication. Many islands in the Pacific were proving to be great spots for waypoints and outstations as airplanes traversed the oceans. So as the world entered into the middle of the 20th century, Carabas was becoming a crossroads for many different nations. Carabas was forced to quickly catch up with the rest of the developed nations and were quick to pick up modern technology and lifestyles. Just in time, too, because the World War was on its way, and nobody was ready for that. During World War II, the islands were occupied by Japan, which was later ejected by Allied forces in the, one of the bloodiest battles in the U.S. Marine Corps history. The Battle of Tarawa, and I think I'm saying that right, was the first African, excuse me, was the first American offensive in the critical Central Pacific region. It was also the first time in the Pacific War that the United States had faced serious Japanese opposition to the amphibious landing. Previous landings meant little or no initial resistance, but on Tarawa, the 4,500 Japanese defenders were well supplied and well prepared, and they fought almost to the last man, exacting a heavy toll on the U.S. Marine Corps. It was only until 1943, two years before, that the war in the Pacific would come to an end, 
that the Japanese forces would be forcibly expelled from the Gilbert Islands, and many of the inhabitants of the Ocean Island had already become refugees from other Gilbert, Phoenix, and Lion Islands when they were relocated to Rabi Island. That's a little Fiji island that the British Empire had acquired for exactly this reason. Further military operations in the colony occurred in the late 1950s and the early 1960s when Christmas Island was used by the United States and the United Kingdom for nuclear weapons testing, including hydrogen bombs. The Icare Bass probably didn't like the having their land used as a highly rac- radioactive weapon experiment, and I imagine that that's why they pushed for independence. The Gilbert Islands gained the independence as the Republic of Carabas on 18, excuse me, on 12 July, 1979. Then in September, the United States relinquished all claims to the sparsely inhabited Phoenix and Lion Islands in a 1979 treaty of friendship with Carabas. Although the indigenous Gilbertese name for the Gilbert Islands proper is Tugara, the new state chose the name Carabas, the Gilbertese spelling of Gilberts, because it was more modern and acted as an equivalent of the former colony to acknowledge the inclusion of Banba, the Line Islands, and the Phoenix Islands. The last two archipelagos were never initially occupied by the Gilbertese until the British authorities and then later the newly founded Republic government resettled the Gilbertese there under the resettlement schemes that were supposed to help with the overcrowding of the main island. The first president of Carabas, Ari Tabai, served for the full three-term limit followed by the Carabas government starting in 1979 and is widely regarded as a capable and most able leader of the Pacific Islands. In 1995, Carabas unilaterally moved the international dateline far to the east to encompass the Line Island group so that the nation would no longer be divided by the dateline. The move was intended to allow businesses across the expansive nation to keep the same business weak. This also enabled Carabas to become the first country to see the dawn of the third millennium. In 1999, Carabas became a full member of the United Nations, 20 years after it had gained its independence. Unfortunately, Carabas may not have been around much longer, or it may not be around much longer. The climate change and rising sea levels have threatened the very existence of Carabas, which consists of 32 low-lying islands that are only about 10 feet above sea level and a mere 1.2 miles wide leaving very little room for residents to retreat from their eroding shoreline. A rise in temperatures, drought, and the attendant depletion of of fresh water have put a strain on the economy and the well-being of the residents. Plans have already been made with Fiji, Australia, and New Zealand to accept the Carabas citizens as permanent refugees as the ocean level continues to rise and swallow more more and more of the Carabas Islands. There are plans to one day evacuate the entire population of Carabas to Fiji, but until that happens, the government has been urging people to migrate to other countries. Isn't that really sad? All of this history, we can see it coming. It's going to disappear. I can't even begin to imagine what it must have been like to have to plan for that day when your own country would just simply cease to exist. I guess in a way, it's kind of like preparing for a funeral. You know it's coming, but you're never sure when it's really going to arrive. And no matter what, it's a shock to your system. So while the nation is still around, let's talk about their funeral practices, an ancient tradition that I think all of you will find very interesting. Today, a Carabas funeral may follow Catholic or Protestant traditions with a service and a burial or cremation, But in the old days, and even in some regions today, the burial practices of Carabas are vastly different to what they were what they are today. In the old religion, the Carabas people believed that all powerful God as well as life after death. Unfortunately, thanks to the efforts of the 
Christian missionaries, not much is known about what this afterlife entailed, but we do know that the native god of Carabas is called Naka, a guardian that would have been would, that would welcome the deceased to the land of the dead. In order for the dead spirit to be accepted, though, a certain requirement had to be met. Let's uh, I don't know. Let, let's call it a ritual. To start off, Carabas funerals began with a wake. Hey, I like a good wake. And when a member of the community passes on, the body's kept in the home uncovered and visible for all to see for up to three days, maybe a little longer if the person was a key figure in the community. During this time, friends, family, and other neighbors come by to pay the respects. The body of the deceased is oiled each day to keep it from drying out, and any dead or decaying flesh is removed as needed. To help with the smell, the family will put flowers in the body's mouth, nose, and ears, as well as burn leaves and other scented resources. Now, I know this may seem odd, but actually, a funeral practice called home funeral, and it's a, got a growing popularity here in the U.S. and in Canada. When in all respects have been paid, the deceased is buried, usually in a family plot fairly close to the home. Now, you'd think a funeral ends here. The community mourns, everybody eventually moves on with their lives. Guess what? This time, you'd be wrong. Several months after the body is buried, it's exhumed by the family of the deceased. The skull is removed and the body is placed back in the grave. The skull goes home with the family to be cleaned and polished and put on display. Now, the question you ask here is why, right? I'm not really sure, but historians believe that if the god Naka saw the skull being taken care of by the family, the spirit of the deceased had lived a good life, earning a place in the afterlife. The skull remains in the family home for years as a revered possession, so much so that loved ones will even leave offerings of food and tobacco. Children and widows of the deceased will eat their meals with a skull and carry it with them everywhere they go almost as if the dead is still with them. Interesting, huh? And who knows, maybe they, maybe that person is with them. I mean, who are we to really question that, right? The skull may eventually be buried again, either with a body or in the yard by the family home, with the top sticking out of the ground. As the teeth fall out of the skull, they're made into a necklace. Talking about keeping granddad around, wow. So, though 95% of Carabas people follow a denomination of Christianity and provide their loved ones with traditional Christian funerals, I can't help but wonder whether these skull burials hold any sway over the people of the small, uh, of the small country today. After all, nothing ever completely goes away, right? Take their food, for instance. Some recipes used hundreds of years ago are still enjoyed today. I'm about to tell you about one of them. Mahi Mahi. It's another name for a common dolphin fish, and it's a delicacy in many Polynesian islands, including Hawaii, Fiji, and, you guessed it, Carabas. Heck, down here in Florida, we eat Mahi Mahi for sure. This recipe for Carabas glazed Mahi Mahi is simple and delicious, but you'll have to keep a close eye on it since the glaze has this tendency to burn. This dish can be made on either a stovetop or a grill. What you're going to need? Two pounds of mahi-mahi fillets or any fish that is similar to the consistency that you like. And that's kind of a what I call a steak consistency. Half a cup of teriyaki marinade. One tablespoon of balsamic vinegar. One tablespoon of honey. One teaspoon of fresh ginger root or paste. One teaspoon of chili paste. One clove of garlic minced. Two teaspoons of coconut oil, sesame seeds are optional, and of course, salt and pepper to your taste. Coconut oil, coconut oil to cook on the stovetop, or else, or oil if you're on the grill, so that you can at least keep the fish wet. In a shallow baking glass, mix together the teriyaki marinade, balsamic vinegar the ginger, chili paste, garlic, honey, coconut, some coconut oil, and the sesame seeds if you've decided to use them. Season the fish fillets with salt and pepper and place the fish in the dish to marinate. 
cover it and let it refrigerate for at least 20 minutes. And sometime during that period, make sure to flip it over so that it marinades evenly. So first heat some coconut oil, if you're cooking in a skillet. Put enough in there that it'll coat the bottom of the skillet. And heat it to medium high heat. If you're on a grill, just make sure that you have some coconut oil handy just to, to uh, glaze the fish before you put anything else on it. Remove the fillets from the marinade and reserve the marinade. Fry the fish for four to six minutes per side, turning only once, so the fish will flake easily with a fork when it's done. Remove the fillets to a platter and keep them warm. Pour the reserved marinade in the skillet and heat it over medium heat until it turns into a glaze. What you're doing is you're reducing it. Spoon the glaze over the fish and serve it some, some of the extra on the side as a dipping sauce. Now, most people eat it with white rice and pineapple. And I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. I've been your host, Scott Parrish, and I'd like to thank you for listening to Dying to Eat. I really hope you've enjoyed this episode about the small but fascinating nation of Carabas. This show is made possible by listeners like you. I'd like to give a special shout out to Corey Fonville of Virginia and Jasmine Bacocho of the Philippines. Your support drives the show and we enjoy hearing from you. Find us on Facebook and Instagram at Dying to Eat Podcast. Let us know what topics you'd like to listen to. We enjoy hearing your comments. Please give us your comments. Find future and past episodes on your favorite podcast platform. Make sure to drop us a five-star like. And don't forget to hit that subscribe button to stay updated on all of the latest episodes. And until next time, stay lively.